good morning everyone. We welcome our guest speaker to our online worship this morning, the Reverend Robert Amos, who was with us in the building last week and has shared a message online with us this week. So, welcome to worship.
So we come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. As we pray this morning, we're going to make this a little bit more personal. And we're going to do that by having some periods of quiet and silence. And so first thing, the first thing we're going to pray for is things that we are thankful for. And so in a moment of silence, please think of as many things you can that you're thankful for today. Lord, we thank you so much for all these things. We thank you for every privilege, every blessing, every person and every moment that we've prayed for there. And in a moment of silence, we ponder the, uh, the times in our lives for the last couple of weeks where we've fallen short and perhaps we need to say sorry. And Lord, where we have fallen short, where we've done the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, or even thought the wrong thing, we thank you and we ask for your forgiveness. And this morning, Lord, this evening, Lord, whenever we are watching this service, wherever we are worshipping you, we ask that you're with us 
that you share with us and that you show yourself to us that through this act of worship we will en encounter you we will encounter your love and forgiveness and we will know that you are present with us on that spot we love you lord amen our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen
Good morning and welcome. And today we're thinking about the gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verse 30 to 37. But in thinking about uh, that passage, I want us to go back to Psalm 90, verse 12, where we're encouraged to number our days. How many days have you lived on this planet? Uh, there's a calculator on the internet where it's worked out that I have lived 24,555 days. And so when we're thinking about this passage, I want us to think about in not counting our days, but in making our days count. It's been worked out that Jesus only lived for 12,045 days on this earth. But yet historians and theologians all agree that he was the most influential person that ever lived. From the age of 12, he demonstrated that he knew his life's purpose, which was to do the will of God. Even when God's will for him was painful, even when his friends ran off, he still lived to fulfil God's purpose. And in this gospel passage, in Mark's gospel, we read that Jesus taught him some home truths. Up to then, they hadn't really had a blueprint for the future. But he told them that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, but after three days he will rise. And the reason that Jesus understood his purpose so clearly was because he was thinking with the mind of God. Throughout the Gospels, we read of his diligence in prayer. And through prayer, he filled his mind with the thoughts of God. He filled his hearts with the with the will of God and he filled his mouth with the words of God and he pointed his feet to the pathways that God had laid out for him. And that's the challenge that Jesus faced. Up to this point he has used, it's been calculated, 12,037 of his 12,045 days. So he wanted to make sure with the disciples that they knew what his message was. It was a clear teachable moment. He sat down and that was the normal way of teaching. And Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be very last and the servant of all. And to show them what he meant, Jesus took a little child into his arms and said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. That might not, not sound so amazing, but it was, because in the time of Jesus, of course, children were loved as they are now, but they weren't as important as they are today. More than half of them didn't live to be adults. Many were exposed, simply put out in a field to starve to death. If there was a shortage of food, children were fed last. Now, none of these things intended to be cruel. These were things that people did because they felt that they had to do them to survive. Children had no rights. It wasn't a good time to be a child. Children, along with tax collectors and sinners, were considered second-class citizens. Now, in some societies, that attitude persists to this day, and especially with the way girls and women are treated in different societies. They who would be first must be last of all and servant of all. Whoever receives a little child like this receives me, said Jesus. Jesus was calling his disciples to a, a radical new vision of what the kingdom of God is all about. And when he took that child in his arms, he was, he was asking them to be childlike, not childish. And I'm thinking, and I'm sure in the Gospels, of that particular time when you feel that you could, in a sense, freeze children. Now, as a granddad of three youngsters, I know about the terrible twos and the tantrums at times, but I've also known those special, special moments of being childlike. I think that children have short memories. They haven't yet learned to bear grudges and nourish bitterness. One of the great things about children is they have a great sense of humour. I think the most beautiful sound in the world is the laughter or a child giggling, the way that they laugh so easily. I remember visiting a member of mine in a church where 
this lady's husband had died and I went to visit her and a great granddaughter was there and her mummy had asked to come out and see if I wanted a cup of tea. So I said, yeah, I'd love a cup of tea. And she went back in and said, yes, mummy, the prime minister would like a cup of tea. Children are open to people. They are trusting. I remember reading a story of one MP who said one of the greatest things that ever happened to him was this little child who tugged on his, his jacket and said, excuse me, mister, can you tie me shoelace? Children are always inquisitive. They will ask questions. And one of the most questions that they ask is why? I often remember my children when they were little trying to extend their bedtime before I switched the light off. And my son James who would say, Daddy, how does a car engine work? And I would talk to him about how an internal combustion worked. Daddy, how many stars are in the sky? And this went on and on and on until he finally said, Daddy, who invented wallpaper? And I said to him, Herbert Wallpaper. Good night. Children accept loving authority. There were some children in a playground and one said, My dad is a doctor. He makes me better for nothing. Another one said, My dad is a teacher. He makes me clever for nothing. Another one said, My dad is a Methodist minister. He makes me good for nothing. I think also that children have a sense of wonder. And there's that lovely story with the Amish community in America where they went out for a drive when all of a sudden one of the wheels broke off and they didn't have car engines or electricity, things like that. So one of the uh, the people who were steering had to go back to the community to fetch a wheel. So they sheltered as it was raining in a in a shopping mall. And as they got there, they looked at the lights and were amazed and the little lad had never seen this before. And they got to the central part where they saw this big silver cube and there were lights going up and lights coming down. And the doors opened, people went in, people came out and they were amazed. Grandma had to go and visit the restroom. And so as they stood watching, they saw this old lady with a Zimmer frame. She went towards this the screen. She pressed the button, the screen opened. She went in, the doors closed, the lights went up, the lights came down and out of this these doors came this beautiful blonde young lady. And uh, the little lad looked at Grampy and said, gee Grampy, what's that? And he said, quick, go and fetch your grandma. Children have a sense of humour. They have a sense of loving. They have a sense of trust. And all these qualities that Jesus wanted to the disciples to share. That's the kind of kingdom. That's the kind of life. No bickering about greatness, about status, prestige and power and knowledge. He calls us to be childlike, not childish. Amen. So when I was talking to a so-called friend, also now known as an ex-friend, they thought that maybe I wasn't the person to respond to this because for me, childish is easier than childlike. They probably got a point. However, if we're going to embrace our relationship with Christ in a childlike way, I want you to reconsider the things that you loved as a child. Maybe it was the simplicity of peeling PVA glue off of your hands. Maybe it was wonder at the middle of a crocus. Maybe it was fascination with all things trains. And I want you to take one aspect of your relationship with Jesus. One thing that you know that Jesus has done for you. Part of the world that's been created for your enjoyment. Or something similar to that. And take some time to meditate on it. To fixate on it. To find out more with a childlike interest. Maybe it's to study your fingerprint and look at the tiny details. Maybe it's to notice carefully the way that the daffodils sway in the breeze. Maybe it's to watch curiously as the geese fly over on their migratory path. But this week, find time to be more childlike, to re-embrace your father 
with the love of a child and see faith through fresh eyes. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that in all of your complexity, you embrace us in our simplicity. That when everything else is gone, the heart of it is you. What you've done for us and how much you love us. Lord God, help us not to get bogged down in the dogma and doctrine. But to luxuriate in who you are. And to love you with a fraction of the love you have for us. Father God, our Dad, thank you. Amen. As we look at some photographs, I invite you to pray whatever comes to mind, whatever is on your heart as you see them. As we bring before God our prayers for the world, for others and for ourselves. Let us pray. So thank you for joining us in worship this week. And as we leave the building, as you turn off your TV, iPad or phone, please take a piece of this service with you into next week. Remember that God's with you whatever the week throws at you. He's with you for every opportunity you get to share his love. So God bless you and may his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And we'll see you in two weeks' time for our centenary weekend service. we
Yeah. 